Thank you. Well, um, and today's uh, what, um, you know, the call for, for this um, uh, presentation is save our ocean, protect our, um, our future and climate change. So all that put together by Warwick and District United Nations Association. Um, and one of the things I would like to mention is that uh, the, um, I'm giving this series of talks uh, for different groups and, and UNAs in the context of the coming next year of the Co-op 26, which is obviously very important where the UK government is hosting uh, this important climate action summit, but also for us to be aware of that um, the United Nations is also launching next year the Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development running through 2021 to 2030 um, as part of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, particularly, um, you know, so, so that those two events are happening next year, important ones for us to keep in mind. Um, right, here we have this, we start from space and you will wonder why we start from space because from space clearly we see the Earth as a blue planet. And, um, and it's very important for us to keep in mind this because two thirds of the planet is water. We are connected physically by the oceans, uh, by water, not by land. Um, so that, the fact that this, this, this proportion, two thirds, it should tell us something about how important the oceans are for the sustainability of our planet. Our planet, it's a system and, and, and we need to incorporate land and sea and everything that's happening together. It's one planet, it's one system. So that's very, very important. And it's one thing that it's the, all these COVID-19 is um, one of the important lessons I would say that it's showing us is that because we've got a global system um, in terms of the planet and in terms of how the planet works sustainable, is that multilateral action is absolutely necessary to tackle these global threats, these global problems, such as the climate crisis. Um, perhaps we could have, we could argue that the pandemic could have been, um, you know, um, stopped much easier if the multilateral action between um, member states of the United Nations would have acted together much easier. But as we know that global, global governance is not always easy. So geopolitics has a lot to say into all this, what's, what's we, what we're talking about and what we talk about um, the climate crisis. But going back to, we need um, um, a systemic approach to tackle this. And really what we need is, is to fix the broken relationship between the human environment interactions. That's, that's absolutely essential. And we will see um, why into this. And I will put emphasis as well in behavioral change as climate action at, at global level. But, um, but yes, Earth for, from space. Um, and the more we understand how Earth sustains life, the biosphere, the more we will understand the human impact over it. So we need the, to understand this. For example, we need the whole solar system in order to sustain our planet and our climate. The sun, yeah. for example, absolutely essential for us, for life on Earth, binding us binding our solar system together through its gravitational force and its radiation. It's essential for our biosphere. Let's think about the other planets in our solar system, as, as, distance, as distant as they are, uh, but we need them to stay in stable orbits for, um, for our planet to stay in a relative stable orbit so that we can have a stable planet, um, a climate. Um, and that is through all the planet's gravitational forces as well. Um, it's by physics, that's interesting. Now we have here the, the, um, the moon. The moon also, through its own gravitational force, has an impact and, and influences our climate. How? Because we have to remember that the planet, our blue planet, it is a spinning sphere basically, spinning on its own axis. And the reason we don't go wobbling, you know, uh, all over the place as a, as a spinning sphere is because of the moon um, and its gravitational force keeping us 
fairly in fairly stable or um, you know um, orbit and 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 preventing from spinning all over the place so we also need the moon as part of our system let's move a little bit further and here we have now we all I think we're all familiar with all the um, the issues you know the, the, as a blue planet we face extreme weather changes affecting the world and ocean sea levels rising heat waves floods droughts glaciers and polar oceans melting away global warming and rising to co2 emissions ocean pollution plastics microplastics but when we look at this picture here we see the proportions of our planet and it's important to see the contrast between the equator, for example, uh, much warmer, where it's hosting on land, all this wonderful and beautiful uh, biodiversity and, 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 and rainforests uh, giving us oxygen and, and everything. We also notice, for example, the poles, the North Pole, um, the Arctic and the Antarctic, which uh, the frozen parts of our planet is the cryosphere. And, and they are absolutely essential these contrasts they're absolutely essential to keep our planet sustainable um, and, and as we will see and the oceans play a, a huge part in all this balance and that is part of what I, I intend to sort of try to explain in this talk but let's start with um, with a specific problem and a specific issue and this is a clear example of the human impact on our environment it's visible it's undeniable. Everyone can see it. Um, and what is called the plastic soup is everywhere in the planet. It's concentrated in certain areas, particularly in the very poor, poor communities around the globe, particularly in poorer countries, mostly suffering. But this is a, that's, that, that's the visible part. But what we need to notice into, into all this um, um, uh, problem two things on the one hand how is this plastic mess is related to the climate crisis there is a relationship and i will try to explain it but also it's the so there is an invisible impact of of human impact and this is this is what it's about and behind all what is visible is the destruction of marine ecosystems and their biodiversity and all that those ecosystems and biodiversities are absolutely essentials for the sustainability of our planet we damage them we damage those those ecosystems we damage our own living we damage the whole planet ultimately it comes back to us as a crisis as we are experiencing there on the right hand side you've got there a very um grim picture of what used to be a beautiful coral reef just imagine beautiful colors full of life full of, of all sorts of forms of biodiversity coral reefs underwater are one of the most biodiverse um, habitats in the planet on land one of the most um, biodiverse ones is the rainforests underwater coral reefs are one of the most biodiverse we need both we need to keep both we need to keep the um, on the one hand all those beautiful uh, on land inland uh, biodiversity but also the underwater underwater ones and this that what you have there on the right it's um uh, is one of the effects of of global warming affecting the atmosphere but having an impact underwater this is the product of ocean acidification that is the destruction of an entire uh, coral reefs entire habitats underwater so this is the real issue that we don't see and we will uh, and i want i want to come back to the plastics in a minute because it's, it's something that it cannot be denied you know uh, not even climate deni climate change denials can deny that there is a you know a problem with plastics because it is there for everyone to see but i quote sir david attenborough here because this quote is very very important and he said as a young man I felt I was out there in the wild, experiencing the untouched natural world, but it was an illusion. The tragedy of our time has been happening all around us, barely noticeable from day to day. The loss of our planet's wild places, its biodiversity. And that is absolutely the tragedy what's happening. 
But let's go back to our example, plastic and climate, the hidden costs of a plastic planet. And I'm quoting here the Center for International Environmental Law. Uh, they published its important report on this issue uh, last year. Very reliable because it's based actually on the projections of the, pet, the global petrochemical industry. So this is not just uh, university research, it's actually uh, factual figures of their own projections by the petrochemical industries in terms of what is the projections for the plastic industry in the in the coming years and this is the this is what has been discovered the problem with plastic it's not just that it's it's environmental um it's it's oh, yeah? our environment um, um you know visible. but the problem is that emissions from the, the, the issue is the, the emissions from the plastic lifestyle, sorry, life, life cycle, from the plastic life cycle. This is what this report found out from those um, statistics from the petrochemicals, that currently the, um, the plastic industry, it's emitting 0 0.86 gigatons of CO2 emissions per year, per year, which equals to 189 coal plants per year at full capacity. That means, in, in, a, in actual practice, it means millions of cars with, you know, uh, with no, no hybrids, I mean, completely fossil fuel powered. That, 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 that's, and if we thought that, for example, we were closing down coal plan, plants, we have to think again, because the, in, in many ways, the plastic industry is replacing them. Why is that? Because the origins of plastics is actually fossil fuels. It's, it's fossils, uh, you know. Um, the projections for 2030, it's 1.34 uh, uh, gigatons of CO2 emissions equals to 295 coal plants at operating per year at full capacity. Again, much more millions of cars. The projection for 20 2050, 2.8 percent uh, so, uh, gigaton CO2 emissions equals to 615 coal plants uh, with annual emissions at full capacity. Um, the, um, the, the, the estimation is that by 2050 that will equal to a, about five, uh, 45 million new cars into our roads. That is roughly what per year, per year, um, the, the projections from the plastic industry. So this is this is part part of what is what what the the, um, the challenge is um, in this particular example. And this is the greenhouse emissions from the plastic life cycle. And it's and the problem is start uh, they start as fossil fuel the fossil fuel extraction and transport as we know. Then of course that has to uh, that um, those molecules need to be refined the plastic refining and manufacture, um, which involves obviously m more um, into um, greenhouse emissions. Then it's the plastic waste management, including incineration, and the plastic ends up in the environment, as we know, oceans, waterways, and landscapes. So the problem here is the whole of the life life cycle. And as a matter of, um, um, also uh, put there as a note, the plastic can be used as fuel energy on an industrial scale through a process called pyrolysis, not because I want it to be used, but just to illustrate that their origins is actually fossil fuel. And, um, and plastic it's, it's, is being used as, as energy in certain parts of, of the world and in this country, by the way. Um, so we need to be aware of that that the, the problem is, is much bigger. And, it, and if we thought that this was an issue only for the oceans, it's actually a global issue because as obviously greenhouse emissions go back to, to, to the atmosphere. And that is, um, so, so um, this other one, it's, it's just um, pointing out by 2050, the same, um, if you think the, 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 the projection of the, for the petrochemicals is absolutely exponential. This is what they project to produce in the, in the, by the year 2050. So it's, and that, this is based on the demand. Their projections is based on global demand of plastics. And the question for us is then, 
where is that demand coming from? Now, the next graph explains a bit where that demand comes from or projected to come. World's plastic demand may increase significantly, and it's the, these projections are based on business as usual growth for the market uh, increased plastic use through um, to the year, you know, 2100. 2000, um, and by regions. So we might think that North America, Europe, Latin America, right on the bottom there, on the bottom right, it's fairly stable. So in a way, the projection is not going to um, grow that much. Developed Asia, perhaps not doing too badly. But then when you look at China developing Asia and the Middle East and Africa, the projection, again, it's exponential demand of the plastic industry. Again, this is, um, this is based on the petrochemical um, industry um, own uh, um, you know, projections. And, um, and, and here, here is something very important for us to notice, because it's actually the demand is going to increase, apparently, from poorer countries, from developing countries. So the, this demand, this global demand, is linked in many ways uh, is suggesting is linked to by um, um, with um, global poverty, global poverty, and one of the reasons that this might explain it is because plastic is cheap, is cheap to produce, is cheap cheap to buy, and therefore poorer countries can afford it. Um, so that's one of the questions that brings us in again to how do we tackle, for example, if we are going to tackle the climate crisis, we also have to tackle all the other issues, uh, you know, in the um, in the in the, in the, the global the global issues like like um, poverty. Um, so it's it's all interlinked. Um, I, I'm not going to stop here. That's the um, um, Europe. I, I want to go back to go to back to. Um, Science, scientific, uh, some scientific facts. And here we have a, th a thermal satellite image of, um, of, the, of the globe. Basically, our global climate, it's governed by redistribution of heat. We have to remember that we have, um, we live in a, in a sphere, our planet is a sphere, is slightly tilted towards the, uh, the equatorial sites, uh, you know, parts of the planet are tilted towards the sun. So uh, our, the, right, the radiation, the heat, it's obviously concentrated around the equator as this satellite image. The blue part in this image is obviously co colder, um, cooler parts of the um, which is um, the, the polar regions. Um, now the planet, as, because it needs to be sustainable, doesn't like this type of imbalance. And naturally what tries to do the, uh, the, our system is to redistribute this, um, this heat and it's trying to do it to redistribute from the equator to, 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 the, to the poles. And it does it particularly through the atmosphere, but also through the oceans. Both the atmosphere and the oceans work together, redistributing this heat to provide us with a global stable climate. Now the picture is slightly more complicated. Now that, that uh, and I, I'll, um, because we are not a static sphere, we are rotating sphere. And that rotation of the earth on its own axis means that this um, redistribution of heat also generate winds and it's a network of winds and a, what is called the Coriolis effect and the global, global wind belts. All that combination between redistribution of heat from the equator to the poles but also with a rotation uh, of the earth gives us ultimately a global, a fairly global um, um, climate with the with wind cells around you know surrounding our, our, our you know our biosphere and, and and there's lots of interactions between the oceans and 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 uh, and and the atmosphere particularly because this redistribution uh, it takes place uh, globally um, so all this um, it, it's, it's roughly what gives us our, um, our climates 
also it generates the Earth's jet streams when we hear in the, the in the news for the weather forecast. Uh, you know, there's another you know um, gales coming through. It, it's it's generated through all the system, and and the jet streams are are generated through through that through that redistribution of heat and also the rotation of the earth with the Coriolis effect. Um, in the oceans, what happens, that is what happens, you know, in the atmosphere. What happens underwater is something similar. It's because the oceans have a huge thermal capacity, they absorb heat from the atmosphere. This is where the, the atmosphere and the oceans interact, particularly the lower parts of the atmosphere, which is the troposphere the lower parts of the atmosphere and the oceans. And the, the oceans absorb, have a huge thermal capacity. Just the first three meters of the depth, in the depth of the oceans have the same thermal capacity of the entire atmosphere and all its layers. Now that is very, very important because when we think how deep the oceans are, so it tells how the, uh, the thermal capacity, how the thermal capacity uh, of the oceans. And what happens is that between the cooler parts of, of our planet, the polar regions and, and, the, um, and the equator, underwater, it's generated this integrated ocean circulation. The ocean is constantly in motion. And what it does underwater, the red and the blue belts there, it's warm surface flow is redistributed in this, um, con what is called the con conveyor belt. So the oceans is absolutely crucial for us to keep our planet sustainable because it it's redistribute heat in a massive, massive scale. And, and obviously it's very important when we talk about the greenhouse effect, the greenhouse gases, the climate crisis, the, the ocean is, is, a, is a buffer of to, to, for the planet not to overheat. It's like a radiator in the in the in the cars that really to keep us not for overheating the engine, you know. So uh, so this is this happens underwater and, and really is one one ocean. It estimated it can take around five hundred years to complete one cycle of this of this belt, but it's all and this circulation. Um, which again, it's it's uh, influenced by the Coriolis effect, the rotation of the Earth, and 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 the, and, and the heat um, is what ultimately it's going to give us um, also cl um, a stable climate. Let me go a little for with an example. An example of this is the Gulf Stream. I'm sure that most of us have heard of the most the, the Gulf Stream. It's usually referred on the uh, on television or with the um, the weather forecast, etc. Et but this is what happens underwater. We don't see it. We we don't. We through the ocean currents, which are um, generated by that global system. What happens is that masses of water travel from the warmer waters of the Caribbean all the way up north on through the Atlantic carrying heat underwater they carry heat and then when they reach us ah Europe you, you know you, the European um, continent it releases the heat into back into the atmosphere that is one of the reasons why we tend to have generally speaking milder milder climates milder weathers including in the winter otherwise perhaps we would be under snow as siberia is because of the influence of the gulf stream because of the influence of the gulf stream is that we have a green and pleasant land and that is thanks to the oceans that brings us that lovely warm heat from the caribbean we wish we would have um, bring us more sun as well from the Caribbean, don't we? <laughs> anyway, but uh, let me explain a little, a, little bit, a little bit more, I still have some time, about how this, this ocean circulation underwater is powered by the difference in, in, um, in, in heat. And this is what is called the Atlantic Ocean Thermohaline Circulation. And, um, and basically it's transporting 
heat that red the, the red band there is transporting the heat that is part of the uh, the Gulf Stream, transporting heat, nutrients, and um, and, and and fresh water coming from from the Caribbean. When it encounters the northern part, the cooler waters of coming from the Arctic, what happens? The cooler waters are more dense. They've got more salinity. They're heavier, the heavier waters. So what they do, they push down, back down the deep of the oceans, the warmer waters coming from the, from the Caribbean. When they do that, that encounter of two different masses of water of that gradient of in in terms of heat then is when the oceans release the uh, the heat back into the atmosphere because it has to travel down the water and that junction there of cooler waters warmer waters salinity and nutrients which is very important also for the fishing industry uh, you know we, we can tackle that later it what happens is that it's a it's transfer of energy. Ultimately, our climate is transfer of energy. From heat, then it's, it's, it's transferred from uh, one type of energy into another type of energy. And the other type of energy is kinetic energy, movement. And that happens underwater. And this is what, this is, uh, and here in the Atlantic, particularly the North Atlantic and, and, and you know, um, Greenland is very important here, and, and the, uh, the Antarctic, uh, both, both are very important because both of them, they, they allow this movement of water um, by physics, basically. It's, 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 by, it's by transfer of energy. But they are absolutely essential. And the blue, the blue there is what is it's cold, salty, dense, deep water. So the, all that together, it's what puts in motion that global ocean conveyor belt, which ultimately has a huge, huge impact on our climate. So uh, going back to this, so if we damage, and here's the rub, if we damage the polar regions at it, as it is happening, uh, particularly Greenland and Antarctica, what is called the permafrost in both continents, in both parts of the, uh, of the polar regions, we are damaging this system because this system then is not operational anymore and it's going to damage and it's, uh, our, our global, our global cli climate. And that's why we, for, 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 to stabilize our climate, we need all this contrast and 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 the oceans uh, and and the continent and the atmosphere work together with the cryosphere the um the um uh, frozen parts of our planet now when I, I want to explain something here as well when we talk about rising sea levels and um, you know some some uh, you know climate change deniers object oh but you can't you know you can't have uh, rising sea levels when the arctic ocean for example um um you know um, melts the the the, the ice um in, in the summer but the issue is not that the issue is the the ice on land in greenland which is the permafrost when that starts melting that is where that it 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 causes the rising sea levels the same with antarctica and and the glaciers for example antarctica is a fascinating case it has about 500 glaciers for example a lot of them are, are melting and that is causing more and more rising sea levels um so that's very important for us to keep in mind as well um i'm going to skip over this because i want to explain something else in terms of the climate again and the and the biosphere and the basis of, of life on the planet in, uh, and, and the biosphere is photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. It's cleaning Earth's atmosphere. It's the planet's natural mechanism through an important molecule, which is the chlorophyll molecule. And the combination of carbon dioxide with water and powered by solar energy and the chlorophyll molecule, what produces the, the other side of the equation is um, it's organic matter and oxygen. So let's think of that for a moment. From inorganic matter, CO2, water, it produces organic matter, in other words, life, 
and gives us oxygen. Now, we know for a fact that this is, the, this is what happens with our forests. Uh, in, uh, with the rainforest, the beautiful forests we have here in Britain, uh, across Europe and Asia, all, all the five continents. Um, and this is absolutely essential. Now, the same photosynthesis, this same process, happens also underwater. Underwater. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is that the oceans provides all of us, our atmosphere and all of us, 50% of the oxygen that we need. 50% of the oxygen comes from underwater. So we, if you damage the oceans, we will damage 50% of the oxygen budget for the planet. So that is essential that, again, we look at the planet as one Earth. We damage the Amazon, we damage the big forests, we damage the, the, the oxygen budget. We damage the ocean and the water, we will damage the ocean. Why? And this is one of the reasons why, how it's happened, how photosynthesis happens in, for example, in the coastal, coastal parts of our planet, uh, the coasts, called the kelp forests. Many of you, perhaps if you're divers, you've come across these because we have them across, across our coast here in, in, in Britain. And that is fantastic because all these environments, marine environments and the water, these are very diverse, um, biodiverse ecosystems. But look at the color of those um, underwater plants, basically. They are greenish. The reason is because they have chlorophyll. And what they are doing in the, what is called the photic zone in the oceans, they are producing photosynthesis. They're producing, they're giving us back oxygen. They're powering by, with oxygen underwater, but also releasing oxygen. Uh, how do they do it? It's because CO2 is highly soluble in water. It captures, the ocean is a carbon, it's a massive carbon sink. It's the, it's the largest carbon sink that we have as one single um, mass, if we, if, we, if we look at that. So the oceans are constantly capturing CO2 from the atmosphere and, 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 and producing, and pr through photosynthesis in this particular case, giving us back um, marine life, biodiversity, but also oxygen. And, but not only that, so this is what is called the kelp forest. These are underwater, like the underwater rainforests. Very, very, very important. And we, we need to recover them. We are trying to recover them in Sussex, for example. There are projects about that because because of the importance of these, of these underwater um, forests that produce photosynthesis. But more importantly uh, of, is plankton activity, these tiny little microorganisms in the oceans. Uh, zooplankton, phy phytoplankton, bacterioplankton is called primary production. Two reasons, they are everywhere. There are billions of billions of billions of them all across the oceans, but they play also a crucial role in the, in the climate balance, in the climate balance. We need them, we need them. We need this biodiversity. We, they're absolutely essential for the climate balance because first of all, the very structures, the very structures are made of captured CO2. The very structures, their bodies, are, are, are made of calcium and CO2, uh, carbon calcium, um, you know, um, uh, sorry, I've, I've got exactly the exact molecule, but, but the, it's captured CO2. That's on the one hand, um, and in what is called the, the, um, the uh, what is called the carbon, carbon uh, pump in the oceans, but also the phytoplankton, um, look at the color of them. Look at the color, green. The reason is because of the chlorophyll molecule in them. So these microplankton, these l tiny little creatures are everywhere in the oceans, producing, cleaning, cleaning the oceans from CO2, capturing it through photosynthesis and giving us back oxygen, giving us back organic matter. This is the first stage in the what is called the trophic um the trophic chain the food chain in the oceans that is going to be obviously eaten by other you know um marine uh, creatures 
and um, and, and so on, and 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 it's going to it's going to um, con continue the the chain. Um, but a lot of the structures of, of, this, of these creatures, like the one in the black and white there, for example, is a microscopic a photograph, fantastic one, three-dimensional one. Uh, that structure there, it's made of uh, this carbon calcium uh, molecule, which is also captured CO2 in the oceans from the atmosphere. So these little creatures are absolutely essential for our global climate. We owe them our oxygen, 50% of the oxygen is produced by them. We damage the oceans, we damage our global climate. It's as simple as that. We live in a sustainable planet. So this is just a summary, uh, and I'm conscious that I've got just about a few, few more minutes, so, uh, but then we have question time. Um, so the, in other words, we've got two pumps in the oceans, two carbon pumps. One is the biological carbon pump, mostly through uh, plankton, um, and, and the ocean as a carbon sink, because when they die, when they die, these creatures, the uh, the oxygen tends to um, tends to sink down to the bottom of, of of the of the floor of the oceans, and and stays there for years and years and millions of years. Um, so capturing CO two from from the atmosphere, as I said, because CO two is highly soluble. Now here's another thing, another danger. CO2, it's more soluble, uh, in other words, it dissolves easier and better in cooler waters. So when we have a, war, you know, a warming atmosphere, that will have an effect on a warmer climate. That is what in the end is going, what is going to produce ocean acidification. Ocean acidification comes uh, uh, you know, uh, partly because of the ocean losing its, um, it's an imbalance, losing its ability to dissolve CO2 um, effectively and, and, and a larger concentration of CO2 in the oceans. The very, very complex uh, biochemical um, processes in the oceans, um, but that is one of them. So, so it's important for us to think about the biological carbon pump. This is another example of plankton activity. It's a satellite image composed of about 60,000 satellite photographs put together by a computer generated. But roughly what it tells us, this graphic is, where it is uh, orange and green, sorry, orange and, and, and um, um, bluish or around the northern parts of the of the of the world and the southern if you look that is showing us higher plankton activity the reason is because those are cooler waters where you see there the purple patches the purple patches is usually what is called in the ocean in oceanography is called the ocean deserts because it's a lot less plankton activity it's a lot less fishing activity it's a lot less life some some you know some studies even think of it's almost lifeless it's not lifeless completely but but what it is is a lot less activity the activity because the reason is because it is warmer so again cooler waters are more effective in um, dissolving co2 capturing it and acting as a carbon sink and and helping us with global warming um, so we are damaging um, the, the IPCC, I quote the IPCC, CO2 dissolution process is dependent on water temperature. As the water, um, as the water, sorry, um, as the water gets cooler, low temperature, more CO2 dissolves. Hence the importance of the polar regions in the carbon cycle. Um, sorry, I'm skipped up. Yeah. So that, that's for us to, um, to think a, a bit more of how, in other words, for us is to think together how we can continue to reflect of the impact of human activity in the global system, but taking the Earth as one planet on land and underwater. 
Um, and that the other one is what I have already explained, which is the ocean as a carbon sink, is a physical carbon pump. Um, and that's just by, this, by, by dissolving in the, into the atmosphere and then being transported by the ocean currents and then eventually sinking through that global ocean circulation. Um, but anyway, I think I'm going to finish here, Gian. Is, is that all right? Um, we, you know, um, that is another one that explains more, a little bit more about ocean acidification. But perhaps we can take uh, now um, questions from the floor, you know, from, from the audience. What do you think? So I, I, I've put everyone on mute while you were speaking, Gonzalo. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Um, Shall I stop you? If yeah. people would like to come off mute now and um, present a question to Gonzalo, please feel free. I would like to um, ask um, your, your scientific insight into this question of the acidification uh, of environments and the heat causing migrations of fish. Because I yes. think that might have geopolitical uh, implications with the movement yes. north of fish yeah. away from yes. the tropical. Yes. Yes, thank you, Chris. That, that is a very, very important question. And I think this is where we see um, global governance, the importance of global governance. Um, and, and rightly, uh, as Chris is pointing out, what is happening with all this global uh, ocean acidification and, and global warming is that the biodiversity underwater is gradually migrating. In fact, it's, 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 um, it's damaging or uh, changing the migration, even the migration patterns. It has been observed, for example, the migration of the whales. It's being, it's, it's being um, um, sort of even confused, shall we put it that way. In terms of the stock of fish, as Chris is asking, fish obviously will, f will follow the food, where the food is. And the fact is, as we, as you know, the oceans keep warming up, fish are going to naturally follow, follow fish. It's just, it's just, you know, nature. But, and here's where Chris is absolutely right uh, with uh, geopolitics come in, because what we've got at the moment, and particularly in certain parts, it's that uh, some countries are under the international law of the sea, they are claiming parts of, um, they're trying to reestablish their boundaries, basically. Um, there is one of the articles of the, and the, the International Law of the Sea, for example, that it's, it's not clear of what happens with the, um, the bottom of the oceans, the bottom of the oceans. They're clear about what happens in the nautical waters, you know, but they're more much vague what happens with the, with the bottom. So some countries, what we've got, for example, in the Arctic Ocean at the moment, there's a dispute between Russia, America, um, I believe, I mean, uh, you know, so some, some countries there, they're disputing the floor of the oceans. They're trying to dig into that. Why is that? Because ultimately what they want is control of their resources. They are, they are, minerals they're you know rich riches in minerals but also fish stocks so that is in my view where the institutions the global uh, in, um, you know institutions of the united nations are very important for example we've got the imo the international you know organization um that um they, they work with national governments national navies try to to um to produce this dialogue in terms of avoiding obviously conflict but yes geopolitics geopolitics come, comes into this i know that the un environment program are also very uh, very involved in this the intergovernmental oceanographic commission for example from unesco they're all trying to generate this multilateral dialogue but yes global um geopolitics come into this um as um absolutely i don't know if i answered the question chris but that is maybe you have other other things to no, add no I, I think i think that's true it, it is there there is um i do see russia as a, a a sort of rogue state in a way because i believe they've been building ships in preparation for an ice-free arctic 
and um, they yeah. see their way out of um, to gain a power base in that area, and that's why I'm thinking yeah. there may be conflict with the U.S. and Canada yeah. in that area about rights, yeah. fishing rights, and other other aspects. And I can only see, like yourself, uh, it has to be resolved internationally through the U.N. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you get um, situation like the Cod War we had in the '75. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yes, and 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 if we add that, for example, in in in, in January in January 2021, um, we've got uh, they have to renegotiate the non -proli non -proli proliferation of nuclear weapons treaty between the U.S. and Russia, and that is going to again it's geopolitics, and they're going to put a lot of these issues on the table in order to negotiate a new treaty, which is a big big thing because of the risks of, it puts again on the table, the risk of a, of a nuclear war, if we're not careful. Mm. Um, and um, and they, uh, in those treaties, as we know, they negotiate these other geopolitical issues, like the dispute of the Arctic. But they're doing, because of this loophole in the international law of the sea, with the, with the, 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 the sea floors. So that, that's something we have to watch out and, and, and be careful. So I'm, I'm just conscious we want to get as many questions in as possible. Um, Farnoosh, do you, have, do you have questions or your shoes? Yes, yes, Gonzalo, first of all, thank you very much indeed for your brilliant presentation. On a personal level, as members of our societies, what do you think we can do to lower our impact on the ocean? So. Thank you, um, Farnoosh, that, that's very, another very important question. What we can do? I think there are very many things. On, on the one hand, for example, um, it's to uh, definitely try to reduce um, our um, consumption in, in terms of plastic. And, and let's think about in terms of what else we might be doing that unconsciously perhaps implies even the the, the, the chain, the production chain of, of plastics, as we, as we have seen. I mean, it's not just to do with the, um, an with the environment physically, but also ultimately it's the life, the, the life cycle of plastics. So try, uh, that's on the one hand, to, to try to move away from, from that. Also other things, it, it's, that it's to join um, local campaigns. Local campaigns are effective are effective on, on this, uh, you know, those like a little more sort of drama, well, you've got Extinction Rebellion. There are other, other, other groups like, uh, you know, like uh, Friends of the Earth, for example, great campaigners. I, I work very closely with them in, on, 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 other, on these issues. Um, if when, when we go on holidays, perhaps why not even dedicate a bit of your time for a beach clean, for example, those practical things, you know, writing that writing to the your the local MPs is always very important because at the end of the day the politicians will respond to uh, what the voters are telling them you know and if a, a, a a huge number of, of residents and telling them, look, please put uh, climate change or, or, you know, or ocean pollution on the, on, on, on the table, um, it, it will be important for them um, and, and so on. Um, so, um, I'm on your Greenpeace. Greenpeace is another international NGO. They do tremendous yeah, work. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. I think it, at the end of the day, if we all become campaigners, active campaigners, we can make a change, you know. Um, uh, there is no one campaign that will suit everyone. I mean, uh, for, for me, for example, I mean, I, I'm not so much into Extinction Rebellion, but I, 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 I invite them sometimes to talk, you know, to, to join us or something, because they've got something, we're all different, you know what I mean? So perhaps find a suitable campaign. I think could, I just, could I just ask you to extend, because while we're waiting for campaigns to have the effect, as a single individual, what can I do every day in the way I live to uh, make my impact on the environment less? Again, there are the things that, uh, washing up, for example, um, daily things, washing up, um, 
try to find uh, ecological products, use uh, other types of um, sponge, which is not plastic perhaps, you know, perhaps coming from um, more natural sources. Those are things that we can, you know, changes that we can, we can make, absolutely. Um, you know, we need, to, we need to think pragmatically, exactly. What is my lifestyle? And I always say this is personal behavioral, behavioral change as climate action, as climate action. Um, so, so yes, I, I will look out for those opportunities that we can all make. Thank you. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. I, think, I think we've got Luke who's got a question. I think he's about to, to speak his question now. Um, what are we currently doing or planning to fix the accumulating plastic waste in the ocean? And what are the detrimental effects of this problem if we don't take action? We'll die. Well, um, thank you. That, that's another another good question. Um, I I I could I couldn't at the moment uh, quote exact exact figures, but obviously, um, thankfully, the UK government. Uh, this is an interesting point actually, because uh, as we know, currently, with the issue with 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 Brexit, we're still uh, under the um, the, this um, this uh, agreement, the transition period ag agreement, and all with all the European countries, they all have agreed um, reduce the use of plastics, introducing effectively what what it, what it is a tax in terms of plastic, the use of plastic bags, which is has been massive over the, over the decades. Thankfully, that is going down. So that's one. You know, um, in my view, um, those type of taxes should be much higher. To de you know, from 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 the government, a lot is going to depend what the other side of actually Brexit. You know, in January, we will have to wait and see. Um, and sorry, look, I missed the second part of your question. Um, the detrimental effects if we do not take action. Ah, ah, that's another that's an, another important question. The detrimental effect. We have to remember that. The UK is um, assigned the Paris Agreement and the Paris Agreement in line with scientific research like the IPCC, the IPB, which is the biodiversity, intergovernmental biodiversity one, they've all established that for, for us to have a stable uh, climate for the future, we need to keep um, the, um, the greenhouse emissions under 1.5 degrees. If we do nothing about, let's say for the example of plastics, as I, as I mentioned, the, the issue with plastic is the whole life cycle. If we do nothing by the year 2050, the, the emissions, the CO2 emissions coming from the plastic industry alone, it's, it's going to be between 13 or 15% of the global CO2 budget. If we do nothing about just that, it means that the 1.5% of the Paris Agreement will be impossible to achieve. So your question is absolutely fundamental. So we need to do something about this. Just that, the 15% the of the global uh, CO2 budget is huge. And, and um, if we don't reduce it, as the projections seem to be saying that the petrochemicals they're going to keep producing, then uh, it's almost impossible that um, even even when we change all the cars on our roads, as we are seeing, I mean, the plastic industry is going to replace them because of the emissions. Does Lots that answer your question, um, Luke? Luke? Yeah. Luke? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just. Um, lots of scientists say that we're past the tipping point. Is that true? Science sometimes, perhaps apart from mathematics and physics, you know, the laws of physics, mathematics, physics and, and mathematics are, in my view, exact sciences. Biology is not always an exact science because it changes with life, with changes and, 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 and biodiversity. So, um, so some scientists, uh, Believe, believe that we've passed this tipping point. Um, although I am, I am on that um, 
I'm up slightly more optimistic. I'm with Sir David Attenborough. Um, so David Attenborough, there's, there's still hope. There's still hope. Um, yes. And I would like to believe that, that if we all unite, if we mm -hmm. all work together, we've seen it through this COVID-19 crisis. We have seen that people have reacted looking after their, their neighbours, you know, looking after elderly pair of people and, 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 and other. It's, it, if we recover that, uh, perhaps, that sense of community, of, of global community, and here, you know, the, yeah. the, the UN is quite um, key, mm. perhaps there is hope. I would, like, I would like to believe there is hope. Yeah, okay, thank you. Can I? Can I be heard? Hello? Hi, yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Um, there is the population problem, surely. I was born in 38 when there were 2.2 billion people in the world. Now 7.8 billion people, and we're a very big organism. I mean, it seems to me that probably is at the core of the problem, and I don't know well, most of them have no effect. about it. How can I, you know, already I have ex grandchildren and that sort of thing. What, I mean, mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts on how we can? gradually sort of bring the population down of, of us, our big organism. Quite true. We, we are big, we are <laughs> like, um, you know, um, big predators of the yeah. environment. Uh, in, 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 yes. Um, yes, population, it, it's, it is currently an issue. Um, some statistics, some statistics, they, they are, they, it's, a, it's a bit disputed in terms of the projections. Some statistics, uh, tend to think that in the forthcoming decades the, the global population is going to go down. Currently, it we, perhaps it's not. However, again, we need to resolve certain issues before we can we can sort out these other massive issues. And one of them is it's it's global poverty, because we know that when um, global poverty sometimes. We need to understand what the developing countries, you know, where they come from. Sometimes larger families, for example, depend on their living as, as, a, as a clan, as a group. Yeah. So they need larger families. We tend to think too much sometimes as in, through European eyes. Yes, we've got birth control, this and that. But in other countries and other parts of the world, that, that is not just available. Um, in fact, sometimes even through the religion, it's not, it's not possible. So we need to understand other parts of the world, how, how we can work together as a global community to, to tackle perhaps more underlying issues. Um, I feel uncomfortable just to blame, just like that global population, because we need to understand the, the other communities, their circumstances. Um, and, um, but yes, we, we, uh, the other, on Tuesday, we had an expert on food security uh, with, from Tambridge Wells. And one of the things that he pointed out, um, which is, you know, brilliant, he said, in his opinion, as an expert, there is food available for everyone in the world to sustain, to sustain the world. And, and, um, and, 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 and if we, change certain lifestyles particularly and, and here's where it comes climate justice into into the equation climate justice because the poorer countries are suffering for the consumption of the north of the richer countries we need to weigh that in as well we can't just say oh it's your fault because you have 10 children because those you know so because those 10 children are probably needed for the survival of that community. Yeah. So that is, it's complex, it's very complex. So I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't give a yes or no answer. We need to explore the real issues much, much deeper. And, and, and climate justice comes into this. I'm sorry I don't have a, 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 a you know, perhaps if you were seeking a, a very specific answer, but I would just point out to the more broader issues here. Uh. Oh no, I, I, I'm part of the problem too. We too have children and <laughs> the population has grown in recent years. I mean, in other countries. But, um, anyway, sorry, I mustn't hog the, hog the talk. <laughs> Somebody else? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Mm. 
Hmm. Leila, have you got questions? I think Caroline, I think Caroline is there, Caroline Wilson. Yeah, Ca Caroline is there. Just conscious we've got a couple of people who raised questions on the chat earlier. Do we, yeah. do we have time to fit in two or three more questions? I'm, I'm, I'm all right with time. I'm all right. Yeah, yeah we've got plenty of time. Okay, excellent. Um, Alan has been waiting very patiently. Would you like to say your question now, Alan? Uh, yes, um, thank you for, for all that you've said. Um, you referred to international environmental law. Could you say a little bit more about this? Um, does it carry penalties? Um, does it uh, apply to companies and corporations and individuals or just to countries? Yes, I, I, I would say that I am not an expert in international law of a sea, for example, or other international um, environmental. But um, what, uh, what I uh, know of is that uh, once member states of these international uh, treaties or, or um, a corpus of, of um, law have signed it, it becomes, it becomes enforceable. Um, like, for example, we have human rights violation. We have, if, if, if any state, you know, um, um, you know, violates human, rate, uh, human rights or invades, there are international laws that they have to be answerable. for. That's the reason, obviously, why we were able to, uh, you know, establish La Haye as an international court of justice. In the same way, the countries are bound by these treaties. Whether they respect them or not is another matter. It's a different, uh, it's a different matter. Uh, or, or they do it more overtly or, or less overtly. Um, but, but technically, um, they, they are answerable and uh, if they have signed that, those treaties. And that's why, in the form of sometimes, also it comes the moral, the moral imperative. For example, Let's, let's think about the Paris Agreement, brokered by Ban Ki-moon, actually. Great, you know, at the time. The, the very fact, am I right to think that the moral indictment of the United States and President Trump on the climate crisis is negative because he withdrew from the Paris Agreement? I, I am sure that the vast majority, you know, have placed on that a moral indictment, a moral judgment, because it's, 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 a, it's not a treaty, it's not even a treaty, it's an agreement. But the fact that the most powerful country withdrawn, has withdrawn unilaterally, it carries a moral, a moral, a moral issue there. So that ethics also plays a part into this. And, and we all can try also, not only through, the, through international law, but through ethics, and global morals in that sense, I would say. Okay, thank you. I, um, if I may, just it would seem to me quite difficult to to apply. Um, mm. So, in, in, if a coral reef is destroyed by um, ocean acidification, who is responsible? The the um, the companies that the oil companies that took the fossil fuel uh, uh, um, or the consumers who burnt the fossil fuel yeah, or the yeah. nearby country who yeah. um, I, I, I can't see how a lot of these um, these ethical points can be applied how penalties yeah, could yeah. be inflicted on, on yeah this. no I, I absolutely I absolutely agree I agree with that view Alan um, and I think that that's a big thing uh, in terms of um, ultimately in um, when we talk about for example even nuclear waste for decades have been just chunked down into the oceans. That is still there. That nuclear waste is still there, you know. And, yeah, and who is responsible? In, in some cases, yeah, yeah. we have to make responsible those countries that actually chucked into the oceans the, the, that nuclear waste. We can, we can actually trace them down. In other, in other contexts, for example, yes, we, um, we have to apply sanctions to uh, big oil companies uh, when there's, uh, you, know, um, um, you know, accidents with oil spillage and, and those kind of things. Uh, we have to be watchful. We, we, we definitely need to be watchful. Whether we can, on, on, in the context of ocean acidification, which is so, you know, vast, mm. it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult precisely because it's not localized. 
um, and we cannot blame just say oh you know this country that country or or this company that company caused that as a matter of fact and this is what i think the moral the moral aspect comes in we have to assume that we as citizens of the world we are responsible and 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 um by uh, you know consuming certain products uh we when we consume certain products, when we buy, we give power to those companies. We use more cars, we give them more power because we use their products. Lay of, you know, the law of demand, you know, um, um, and, and supply. So, um, so we, we have a, a moral responsibility, um, but it's not easy. It's not easy to pinpoint who is responsible for what at the stage we are. I think we probably even passed that, that stage. At the moment, we need to, to collaborate on moral grounds and, and survival as well. Thank you. I think we've got Callie and Paul next, and then we can take the question from Caroline after that. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, thanks. Yeah, your presentation was great. Um, all I wanted to ask is about the, if you know, what, what is the current state of the reefs, barrier reefs and the Great Barrier Reef? Um, and if we could do more, uh, to protect the environment by having no go area areas for tourists um is that a good solution uh, yeah just yes. your views on these please that, yes thank you. yes i mean the uh the, the issue with the coral the, the the barrier the coral reefs um as beautiful as they are what what's what's happening is again uh once they they tend to move they they, they move you away uh, from the parts of the oceans that are mostly affected by ocean acidification. The travel, uh, and that could potentially, they, could, they, they, they have the capacity to regenerate. The travel is the speed, the speed. The speed of ocean acidification is much higher than the speed that they can actually adapt. At the, at the end of the day, all species can adapt up to a certain level up to a certain level. Once past a certain level, nobody can survive, you know, no, no, you know. But, but to a certain level, coral reefs are trying, and there is movement, they move, they're mobile, uh, because they are, they are colonies, they are, co they are colonies. The problem is, uh, that's another token altogether, I mean, you know, ocean acidification and coral reefs is fascinating. But basically what happens is that for them to, to stay alive, they've got, they, it, it's, it's, a, it's a symbiosis of two, um, types of creatures. They've got um, a microalgae that it's, it lives inside the coral polyp, the polyp. And that microalgae, what it's doing is photosynthesis. What it's doing is producing energy for the coral. What with ocean acidification, they lose that, that, that microalgae. And that's when they start dying. That's in essence what's happening. So the issue is, it's the capacity of them. Now, there are some interesting projects in certain parts of the world to replant, uh, literally, it's to create plantations of corals to reproduce, to move them manually. And, and there are projects that, that you know, um, scientists are actually planting coral reefs in other parts where the conditions seem to be uh, okay. Uh, through, um, for example, very um, similar methods used in permaculture, for example. Uh, but but done underwater, and and they they they're producing good results. But again, it's the speed, the speed as, as, as is happening. So if we if we can, you know, hopefully we we should be able to stop ocean acidification through lowering lower emissions. That 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 is the key. Hopefully, um, for the time being, to keep them alive. In other words, not forget them to go into extinction. Is to hopefully help them a little bit. If, but that, that, that is the that is issue with coral reefs. <coughs> Thank you. Caroline, would you like to pose your question now? Right. I had two quick things to do. One, the problems of marine reserves. I was really pleased this morning to hear that our government is creating a huge reserve around uh, the British territories in Tristan de Cunha, which is a huge Excellent. reserve, and that they're not going to allow fishing or dredging there. Yeah. Yeah. Equally, 
we have created in the last few years marine reserves around Britain, which you would yeah. think were protected, but that apart from two of them, I gather there is actually dredging, which destroys kelp forests, destroys the ecosystem on the bottom, very destructive, is actually being allowed in these marine reserves, which is, it sounds ridiculous. How do we get our government to really make marine reserve protection areas mean that yeah. and the second question sorry um which was arose from another talk that i heard a long time ago which was the impact of these great fleets of factory fishing mm. things that move around sort of devastating local yeah. communities yeah. the one i heard was how there were fleets this is some years ago were off the west coast of africa getting up all the fish off the west coast of of, of africa in a huge huge ships yep. which meant all the local fisheries then had very poor returns so people had lower lower inputs of food so that had an impact on people needing something to eat so they hunted on the ground so inland off the oceans it upped the consumption of bush meat, which was destroying the onland thing. Um, so it has ramifications. Yeah. And more recently, there were the factory farm, uh, the um, factory ships off the um, Galapagos Islands on the on the migration route of a lot of the endangered species. These huge fleets hoovering up things is a very problematic, and they have great impact. Um, yes. Can you comment? Yes, yes, uh, certainly. I mean, this, uh, can you just uh, um, remind me briefly the first part of the first question? Because you have got to. Marine reserves around Britain. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. With with um, marine reserves, they're, they're called marine protected areas. That that's that's the official mm, title name. Uh, marine protected areas. And, and, the, and, and the clue really is in the name, protected, marine protected areas. And that is how it should be. That is how it should be. Now, these marine protected areas, as you said, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a group, of, a large group of those um, here in the UK. The, uh, currently, the UK government has committed to 30% of our coasts uh, to become marine protected. They're absolutely essential to recover our biodiversity and, and all our fish stock and, and everything across the uh, across our the the, the uk um, and um and, and the marine protected areas by law um, in um they, they should not be exploited now the um we also have um the lo the local uh, fisheries and conservation authorities in all our counties for example here in, in, in Sussex, I am in, I am in, con, con, in contact with the Sussex Marine uh, Fisheries, uh, fisheries and, um, sorry, the, the, the Sussex Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority, for example. Now, that we've got them in all, all across our, our, our coasts. It's their role to patrol, they've got powers to patrol and enforce UK law. Because we that's under it's part of our national waters, so if we see anything, for example, that it's uh, it's causing damage, we should report them. They, they, it's like the police. It's the police, you know, around the UK or UK waters in that sense. They have powers. Uh, it should not be happening, and and particularly if those if those areas have been um, called marine protected areas. Um, and and we, we we campaigned very very um, you know quite a lot um, last year, for example, for new marine co uh, protection zones here in, um, in in the Sussex area, and and thankfully we managed to uh, for the for the UK government to declare a, a big patch of, of of the coast between Hastings and, and Eastbourne, for example, a big a big patch, uh, and that's wonderful. Um, and now it's down to the authorities to patrol that. They have powers. Now, this is linked with the fishing industry as well. I prefer, for example, in Hastings, we have well, the, the largest fishing fleet, you know, in the, I would rather much prefer to keep those smaller communities fishing fleets, which we have 
um, we, we can, how to say it, establish a dialogue because, for example, they're very conscious of, of conservation of the uh, juvenile stocks of, of fish and, 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 and resources. Why? Because they depend, they, they, their own um, survival depends on those. So they're conscious of that. But you are right. The, um, the factory industries, they, they frankly don't care. As, as it, happened, it was in the 50s with the whale industry, what happened with the whale industry? If you remember the, the big factory ships, hmm? it, it nearly killed killed the uh, you know the, the, the all the, the you know the, the whales in in, in, the, in our seas, um, and and so on. So that it's it's more complex. They pollute a lot. Uh, those ships they they cross contaminate between ports and other ports. They they uh, or, or from from the the port where they uh, they start their, their journey into the um, other parts of the oceans um, and um, and they should be a, a more effective way of of patrolling that and enforcing international law um, so it's a failure it's a failure there of of global governance of global governance we should have more effective ways of patrolling and enforcing international law um, but as we know, the, the UN, it's not an, a, a, a world government. Uh, nobody really wants a, a world government because we know what happens with when, when there is concentration of power, the tendencies to, to, to totalitarian regimes. It, it, history has shown us. So, but what something different is global governance. It's something very different and that's what we need something more effective of 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 world governance in my view through the un um, um agencies it's it's the only ones that we've got at the moment but we have to be more effective thank you right um i'm sorry i'm sorry our time's up it's um nearly uh, 10 to 2 and um, all that's left for me to uh, say thank you to everyone for yeah. uh, giving up your time you. and especially thank you Gonzalo for being with us Pleasure. and enlightening us and educating us about the oceans um, and also thank you Chris uh, showing telling showing us uh, our responsibility as individuals what we can do to uh, improve uh, the, the, the the oceans uh, the use of plastic, um, uh, our role, uh, the, the power we have uh, towards uh, our buying power uh, affects uh, industry and manufacturers uh, in that sense. Uh, and uh, yes, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Before everyone goes, I just want to remind you that our uh, next um, Zoom meeting uh, is on 22nd of uh, November, which is week tomorrow. Uh, our speaker is from Jerusalem. He's mm -hmm. Oliver Bridge, uh, who works for the UN Relief and Works Agency in Palestine. It's, it's one of the only UN agency uh, f uh, founded in 1950 uh, specifically working towards the protection and welfare of the Palestinians and uh, so uh, Oliver Bridge will be speaking to us from Jerusalem and the meeting is on Sunday from 6 to uh, 7.45 so in fact like you've done today you can join the meeting from 6 onwards but the meeting itself will start at 6 uh, 6.30 so uh, we hope to look um, uh, look forward to uh, seeing uh, many of you at this meeting. I'm sure Oliver will have a lot to, to uh, tell us about um, the current uh, situation in uh, in Gaza and the West Bank. Uh, this meeting is in conjunction with, in association with the Justice for the Palestinians uh, in, in Leamington. So it's a it's a joint meeting uh, week tomorrow. And we look forward to seeing many of you. And thank you for your support uh, over the years, and especially during lockdown. And I'm afraid I don't know when we're going likely to meet physically. Uh, until then, 
uh, we'll zooming, we'll keep zooming. And but but on the plus <laughs> point, we've had people join from all over the country, which we wouldn't have had, which is fantastic. Yes. Um, so thanks everyone for joining and your engagement and we've got lots of messages in the chat here and privately Gonzalo thanking you excellent presentation thank you thank yeah. you all thank, thank you, you very Gonzalo. much thank you very much yep. yes thank you all right yeah bye-bye 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 take care bye-bye